All right, this video is looking at uh, intelligence testing. So this is continuing on from the last video where we were talking about intelligence testing. Um, but in this video, we are going to look at how do you determine if an intelligence test um, is good. So first of all, intelligence tests must have standardization. So standardization is when you define what a score means by comparing it to a pre-tested group. So every intelligence test has to be standardized, um, as well as a lot of other um, tests that are not intelligence tests, including, for example, the AP tests. So what they will do is, is that they will have a large group of people, a random sampling. Remember random sampling? Random sampling is a uh, where you pull uh, a group of people randomly from uh, the population. Okay, So you'll get a good random sampling. Uh, of people and then uh, they'll have them take the test and then they will have the average of their scores whatever the average is and they will make that the normal the average score of the intelligence test so we have all these people that are going to be taking this test okay and then so the pre-tested group scores um, shows a normal curve where the midpoint or the average is 100 so what they will do is they will take this and for example on this bell curve or call it a normal curve and so they will take um, all of these people that it took in, taking the test they'll take the mean point the average and they will set that at 100 that score is now 100 okay so that's here okay and then um, what happens is, is that anytime and everybody else takes the test after it's been standardized, so after this pre-tested group has taken the test, okay, they're going to compare your score to this um, pre-test, this uh, this um, standardized um, group, right? This um, baseline group. So what they have found, though, is is that it ends up intelligence uh, testing scores end up being like the bell curve. So you have 68% of people fall within this range of one, the 100 midpoint average. So 68% of people fall between 80, the, a score of 85 and 115 on the Weschler intelligence scale. So anybody outside of that, for example, from the 70 to 85 range, about 14% of people fall in that range. And 14% of people fall within the 115 to 130 range. And then you have 2% of the population that are go from about 70 to 55. And another 2% are in the range of 130 to 145. And then less than 1%, 0.2% of the people are above 145 and below 55. So this kind of gives you this nice bell curve shaped curve of people's intelligence scores. Okay, so here's the thing though is, is that tests are re-standardized to keep the average at 100. So every so many years, and I have to look up um, how often they do this, but every so many years they will go and re-standardize the test. What that means is, is that they will take for example the Weschler intelligence scale adult intelligence scale and they will um, go and administer it to a whole bunch of new adults and that will be their new baseline and so then they will take the average of those group of people and all of a sudden that's the new 100 okay that's the new average that's the new 100 that's the new normal okay so then when they do that what they have found is is that over the years when they've done this um, and they have them retake the test okay they have shown this Flynn effect, and the Flynn effect is showing not intelligence tests, but intelligence. I shouldn't eliminate the tests, so ignore the tests. Intelligence um, is actually improving, and so the 100 has been actually moving steadily in this direction. Uh, and so the problem with this is that obviously, for example, people who, uh, you know, people who, if you score less than 70 and you are uh, having problems with like daily living, you can be labeled um, as possibly needing services, um, and you can be labeled um, it, uh, having it some sort of disability. And if you're kind of on the bubble, right? So maybe you have a score of exactly 70, uh, and then they go restandardize the test. Okay, somebody who took it before, if they took it again, 
they all of a sudden would um, qualify for services or whatever, they'd be relabeled uh, because the 100 has moved, right? Um, and has gotten higher, and now their score is that much lower. So that's the idea behind standardization. Tests also have to have reliability. So reliability is this idea of consistent results. If you take the test, if uh, people take the test over and over again, so if they take the Stanford Binet or the Weschler Adult Intelligence Test over again, um, they would have consistent results. Um, you know, within obviously a, a very narrow range. Now, you know what's considered reliable. You know what's consistent. You know that's obviously you have to define those parameters. Um, so taking it over again, you get the same results. So tests also have to have validity. So validity is the ability to assess or predict what is supposed to be measured. So is the test valid? Is it actually measuring what we're supposed to measure? So there are two types of validity. There's content validity and there's predictive validity. So content validity is measuring the behavior of interest. So for example, um, when we're done with this unit, I'm gonna get, you're going to have a test over, um, obviously, intelligence, uh, but memory and a bunch of other things in there. And content validity is making sure that the test actually is measuring what you know about those subjects. Okay, So that's content validity. Same thing as I think the book gave an example of if you're talking about um, the driver's ed test, right? So you take the driver's ed test um, and it is supposed to measure how much you have learned about how to drive. That's content validity, okay? Final exam, same thing. Does it measure the behavior of interest? Does it measure what you should actually know about that particular course? Now, predictive validity measures how well the test predicts the behavior is um, supposed to measure. So, for example, um, predictive validity, remember we talked about those uh, aptitude tests uh, in the last video, and aptitude tests like, for example, the SAT or the ACT, uh, and they are supposed to um, predict uh, how well you will do in college. Okay, so for example, um, when I was in high school, uh, I took the ACT because that was the thing you, the test you took in my area. Um, but uh, I knew a guy in high school who um, scored a 35 out of 36, because 36 is the highest possible, 35 on the ACT. Well, he actually went around, went on to um, go to college, and he went to, uh, to Harvard. He did get a Harvard degree, so obviously you could assume that he was pretty successful in Harvard, uh, as well as uh, he then went on to medical school. I'm not sure if he went to Harvard med Medical School, but I do know that he went to medical school, and he is now a doctor. Okay, Predictive validity. The, for him, the ACT uh, did a good job of predicting um, his future behavior and being able to predict how well he's going to do in college or how well he's going to do in his career. This graph that I found um, was kind of interesting. It's looking at the predictive validity of um, various uh, employee selection criteria. So how do you um, choose somebody to work for your company? So they were looking at, okay, can education, for example, how much education they have, predict how well they're going to do at their job? Well, that, that didn't really have a very good correlation. So that didn't work very well. That was only 0.13. Job experience, previous job experience, is that going to predict how well they do at this job? A little better. Interviews, how about when they took the job, you had to interview them? Did interviews, um, you know, your sense for how they are, you know, and, you know, are they, your sense for, your, are they going to be a really good fit for your company, whatever. That was a, a bit better, better than education and job experience, but the bigger predictor, the better predictor of how well they're going to do as an employee for your particular company is their aptitude tests. So their actual aptitude tests on, uh, for example, intelligence um tests or for example the ACT or the SAT so that was a better predictor of them being like for example a good um, employee and being able to um, do their job well uh, this last one that I wanted to show you is kind of an interesting one that I um, found on the internet when I was looking for uh, examples of reliability and validity um, this one is looking at a bunch of targets kind of illustrating reliability but not validity so the first target this is reliable because they have um, most of their, you know, 
points are uh, very close together. But it's not valid because it's not near the target, right? It's not near the center. This second one is valid because they're all kind of circling around the target, but it's not reliable because they're spread out all over. The third one is not valid because it's not near the target, and it's not reliable because they're not very close together. And the last one is both valid and reliable because they're close near the center of the target and they're all close together. So that's kind of a basic illustration of val validity versus reliability. All right, in class we'll talk about some more examples of this and hopefully that will help because I know this is something that people kind of struggle with. Uh, but let me know if you have any questions.